Howdy, everybody. This is, uh, what is it? It's Tuesday, 11 16, if I do believe. 21st century, I know that. Welcome to Humanities. I uh, hope everything's going okay out there. Your papers are coming along. I don't know when they're due this week, sometime. I'll sign another paper at the end of this week, and that'll be it until after vacation. Um, right now, we're talking about contemporary, well, when I say contemporary uh, music, uh, rock and roll is still out there. Maybe you don't care for it. Maybe you love it. Maybe you live for it. But it started back in the way back time machine in the black and white world. And it started in the 50s. Hope you get in the earliest rock and roll that we know about was by a very uncool, unrock and roll looking dude called Bill Haley and the Comets. Rock around the clock. It became a huge hit. It was music from a movie called Blackboard Jungle about juvenile delinquents being misbehaving. And so there was the first rock and roll movie. Their movies were being made during this time. They weren't using rock soundtracks at all. A good example would be 1955, they made Rebel Without a Cause. Well, 1955, Elvis was pretty big. So was Chuck Berry and Little Richard, and you'd think they'd be perfect soundtrack, but it wasn't. The soundtrack to uh, Rebel Without a Cause is straight kind of um, regular Americana, American Hollywood kind of over-romantic music that they did in those days. So the music wasn't seeping into films yet. Unless they were rebellious youth-oriented films like Hot Rod Girls and things like that. And even that, it wasn't seeping in there too much, but it was starting to come in. Because producers all over the world, film producers, record producers, they noticed that there was a youth market out there. The youth didn't really have their own music. They were still listening to their parents' music. From the 1930s to the 1940s, big band, the bebop jazz is still sort of considered their parents' music in a way. That was a break off, a scoff, a splinter, a rebellion against the uh, dance music of uh, Duke Ellington and Count Basie to Miles Davis that were doing more of an urban harder edge, youthful music that everybody didn't like. Bebop jazz isn't everybody's cup of tea. Either was early rock and roll. It was looked frowned upon. Um, it essentially originated, it came out of the deep south um, through the blues tradition and other things, mixing rhythm and blues. And they were uh, mixing it up and and developed this new beat, uh, the rock and roll beat that you could dance to. And um, but black artists weren't getting played on American or white radio stations, not very much at at least. Uh, and so it took a white singer coming out of the poor South. A uh, rather good-looking guy with the interesting name of Elvis Presley, who took black rhythm and blues music and bluegrass music and folk music from that era, and he put it in a mixture, a blender, and he came up with a pretty heady mix of um, revolutionary music. But he was stealing from the best. But he made it his own stamp. He had a beautiful voice. He looked great. And the girls loved him. And he became Elvis Presley, folks, the king of rock and roll. Now, he was on the standing on the shoulders of black artists like Fats Domino and Chuck Berry and Little Richard. Absolutely. But he always 
acknowledged that and I and they were perhaps bitter of that over that but they also uh, got into the slipstream of mainstream American audiences, white audiences, that is, because of people like Elvis Presley, who brought it up into the forefront of American culture. And let me tell you, it was a youth quake. Kids could not get enough of this rock and roll music. They wanted to rock around the clock. And this is when the hormones are raging and maybe they have a little beer out in the car and they're um, getting kind of frisky and they're not their parents' generation anymore, folks. They're misbehaving. And then actors in movies like Marlon Brando and James Dean were starting to um, present a rebellious, youthful uh, take on what was going on in America at the time. And the kids flocked to these movies like the wild angels, the wild one, sorry, wild angels was later in the sixties, Peter Fonda, the wild one with Ron and Brando I'm talking about and rebel without a cause. Yeah. You know, James Dean, although if you look at rebel without a cause, he's a really rather straight lace rebel. Um, he wasn't a bad boy, but uh, he was, he could be drifting that way. We don't know. Um, but rebellions in the air and kids who couldn't relate to their parents anymore needed a music and an outlet and rock and roll gave them that outlet. And the race was on from then. Everybody wants to start selling and you know how the conglomerates are record companies are no different than movie companies. When something sells, they want to make some money. Uh, look at what they're doing now in Hollywood with all the endless Endless, endless sequels. They're even doing a new Matrix right now. I guess Keanu needs the money. Um, how many more movies can we just see over and over and over and over again? The same, the same movie, essentially. Just uh, new titles. Anyway, um, so this music that was starting to shape the culture... And it reverberated throughout the culture. It reverberated not just through record sales or dances that kids were going to, but it was always coming through the movies. And it was also coming through television. We had a television show in the 50s, really popular show called Ozzy and Harriet. And they had two sons, Ricky and David. Well, Ricky loved Elvis Presley, loved Little Richard. He wanted to be a part of that scene, and so he became a singer-guitar player. And each week, the show would play, and at the end of the show, they'd introduce young Ricky and his band, and they would play a song, and these songs became huge hits. Because people now, not just were hearing it, they see, they were seeing it. And they're seeing the clean cut. He was kind of a clean cut version of the rebellious... Uh, Naughty boy Elvis. He was mom and pie now, you know, and apple pie, as they say, and mom and dad and white picket fence, because that's what Oz and Harriet looked like. And so the audience out there started to become an older generation who go, Oh, these young kids and their kooky music is they're not so bad. Look, little Ricky's doing it. Oz and Harriet's Ricky. He was Ricky Nelson forever. He wasn't didn't change his name. So Rick Nelson until way later. Um, so it became acceptable, and there was an outlet. And it was the first time we'd seen this stuff on TV. Yes, Elvis was going to perform on um, some TV shows, like Steve Allen show, and when he was going to perform on uh, Ed Sullivan, he was told because he, he liked to dance. When he sang, and he, his, his movements were suggestive, sexually suggestive they they told the cameraman not to let the camera go below his waist they didn't want to see that naughtiness whatever was going on down there they didn't want the american public to freak out and so elvis was told to keep the hip hip and shaking rock and roll rattle quieter but elvis was a man who um 
he was a rebel, but he also obeyed his elders. He he was very close to his mother, really close, and he didn't want to, um, you know, embarrass her or shame her. So he he behaved himself, and um, and his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, was an old style uh, carnival manager Barker who managed Elvis with an iron fist and really protected his image. And th he was all about maximum money, not about any rebellion, not about anything untoward that might get Elvis in uh, trouble. Other artists at the time were coming up that like Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent, and they were kind of the naughty boys of what of rockabilly they called it and uh hopefully that documentary i showed you had some of that rockabilly stuff in there uh rockabilly was considered well hillbilly music and rock kind of mixed together it's a little bit more a little bit more um naughty if you could say a little rocking a little bit underground uh it had definitely southern overtones religious uh, when I say religious, I don't mean it was not Christian music. It was rebelling against that, folks. Um, it's like in Marla, in the great movie Wild One when Marlon Brando plays a biker, you know, like a Hells Angels type of guy before the Hells Angels were around. Uh, the cute girl who's interested in him said, she said, what are you rebelling against? And he said, what do you got? So that was kind of the theme of the day. Um, they weren't nihilist, meaning, you know, if you don't know what nihilist is, they did believe in something. They just didn't know what it was yet. They know they didn't believe in the current values of the time and what was going on at the time. I've talked about it since we got into the 50s, post-World War II. Well, we come out of World War II. We defeated Hitler. We defeated Japan. And the world had been at war for almost 10 years. Millions of lives were lost and uprooted cities from Tokyo to Berlin were flattened. And uh, it's a new world order of go democracy, go USA, and Western values. Everybody looked to America. We were a uh, prosperous country. We had a lot of people. We had a lot of resources. We, A lot of countries still to this day can't feed themselves. Um, but we had plenty of room. We had plenty of farm room. We had plenty of people to work on the industrial age, building buildings and roads, and it made us really strong. So, but the kids weren't feeling a place that they've been listened to. And rock and roll gave them an outlet of someone understanding their feelings, not just with lyrics, but with the beat. Uh, when I say kids, I'm talking about teenage kids. Uh, our bodies are changing. Hormones are blasting through us, and we don't understand a lot of it. And so the rock and roll beat kind of eased the, that transition. The rock and roll beat understood what we're going through. Uh, maybe you had your own streak of rebellion. What was it? Michael Jackson? No, you might be too old for that, young for that, rather. Who would it be? Lady Gaga? Yeah, okay. Um, certainly don't say Taylor Swift. If that is rock and roll rebellion, no offense. She sings pretty songs, but that's as far as, far as I'm going to take it. If someone wants to defend her, please do. Um, so the 50s were full of upheaval in um, in the world because of the atomic cold war we're in with Russia, former Russia and now Soviet Union. China is starting to rear its nuclear head. Uh, we're not yet, but we're almost going to get into a nuclear war with Cuba. That's in another couple of years. Not yet, but things are percolating. Politics are ugly right now. Uh, yes, we have a conservative Dwight Eisenhower, former general in the White House. And TV looks like everything's hunky-dory, leave it to Beaver, Father Snows Best, Donna Reed Show, I Love Lucy. Huge hits of the day. Looking at kind of a uh, fantasy of what Americans really live like. 
Most of our mothers did not cook in fancy dresses with pearl uh, necklaces and high heel shoes, waiting for the dad to come home after winning the bread and the two kids greeting him at the door and everybody's happy. And the only trouble they have is maybe their cat is missing. Um, that was white bread America. You won't see a black face in any of those sitcoms. Uh, there was a few sitcoms that were trying to slip in some, some more class oriented. Uh, when I say class, I'm talking about upper class, lower class, uh, Jackie Gleason would be one of them, the Honeymooners. He was a bus driver, lived in a pretty lousy-looking place in New York City. Uh, Ed Norda worked in the sewer. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, you know, bottom of the line, although probably pays well now. I don't think it did then. Uh, but So they were trying to purposely show a blue-collar way of life that a lot of TV wasn't showing. It's not too rebellion, but it was pretty rebellious for its time. There were some other shows that had kind of caricatures of African-American people, like M. San Andy, which would be considered very mortal racist now. Um, so there was no black faces unless they were maids or butlers um, on American TV. But so the black audiences are still watching these shows. And also TV is full of Westerns from Half Gun Will Travel to Gunsmoke to The Rifleman, Bonanza. That was sweeping the country. And there are no black faces in those either. So African-Americans are still shut out for the most part, but they're not shut out of rock and roll. Some of our greatest innovators were African-American. And their voice was being heard. Sometimes it had to, came, had to come through a white singer, like somebody like Elvis or Pat Boone, who was like really safe as you could possibly believe to a mill American. He was singing to the fruity <laughs> by Little Richard. If they see Little Richard singing it, it scares people. He looked scary. He wore makeup. Uh, he had interesting gestures, almost trans, sort of a trans type of a persona. We didn't even know, understand what gay was or homosexuality. We didn't understand it. But Little Richard was a bold innovator. Just look at some of his old YouTube stuff. Um, it scared the hell out of people. He, he It came from his, his Southern Baptist raising of... Uh, preaching and or listening to sermons in the Southern church and they get very enlivened and um, music is a huge part of it. The communal music that they listened to brought them together, gospel music mixed with hillbilly music, mixed with rhythm and blues. And thus we have some rock and roll folks. Um, other huge Famous artists of the time, somebody like Buddy Holly, who came about, and he was an anomaly because he had his own band. He wrote his own songs. He had, they actually played their own instruments. That was rare. El, he, Elvis had other people around him. Um, and that was unusual. That he, and he wrote his own songs. That'll be the day and, and the rest. And he died tragically at 22 years old in a plane crash. Uh, so we never got to see what young Bully would have developed into. He never got to live long enough. Other artists, white artists at the time, Everly Brothers, uh, were uh, brothers, Don and Phil Everly. Uh, they're both dead now. Don Everly just passed away recently. Uh, at least he lived into his early 80s. Uh, the Everly Brothers were... Without them, there'd be no Beatles. Beatles definitely were inspired by all these bands I'm talking to you about, Betty Holly, Little Richard, all of them, uh, and the harmonies of the Everly Brothers. So these people were laying down. Sort of, if you think about it, and I know you guys hate black and white movies, unless you could prove different, um, 
it was kind of a black and white world. These rock and rollers were turning up the color. And there's the revolution for you. So, from writers coming out of World War II, the Beat Generation writers, like Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, they were very much influenced by jazz more than rock because they were just a little bit older. But rock was around them, starting up. Greenwich Village, Philadelphia, Cleveland, L.A. Literature, paintings of Jackson Pollock was very jazz, but it verges on rock and roll also. The rebellion is on in music and literature and all of art in these very strong conservative times where the communist witch hunts were trying to find people who were communists or former communists because they were like a detriment to the people of the government of this country. All this was happening. And so it was a perfect place for rock and roll to ignite and catch fire. Now, I'll talk about the next day or so, the 60s, folks. I know you're probably sick of hearing about the 60s. You're, it's probably a grandparents' error or whatever. Uh, but from the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, to the Kinks, the Yardbirds, and the rest, Jimi Hendrix, and on and on we go. The rebellion is about to catch fire like nothing is ever we've ever seen before or since. Until then, see you next time.